Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Houseplants need special soil. Today we're going to be looking at the different kinds in which to pick. Also, just when the garden gets going, the bugs arrive. Today we're going to talk about the pest of tomato and squash. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Celeste Scott. Celeste is a UT Extension agent in Madison County, and Dr. Frank Hale will be joining me later. Hi, right, Celeste. We have uh, soil on the table today. So what yes. are we going to talk about? Yeah, so I wanted to do you know, a quick demo just to show people um, what our soil products are yeah. made of and what the differences are between them. You know, you go to the store and you see all these different specialty mixes, mm -hmm. potting mixes, um, and, and you oftentimes wonder, well, what's the big difference, right? right? Well, there is a, a pretty drastic difference um, okay. in uh, specialty mixes for a variety of different plants. So today, just kind of wanted to highlight some of those and, okay. and help people know what's inside the bag before they buy it. And we're talking about houseplant media. Right. Yes, okay. yes, media for houseplants uh, particularly. And so I guess we'll just jump right into okay. it. So basically, um, all of those are gonna have uh, some mixture of some of these basic components that we have right here. This is peat moss. And you can see how fine and dry this is. And this is going to be one of the base components of uh, really the majority of our soil mixes. Okay. So it's hydrophobic by nature, means it repels water. Mm -hmm. However, if we put water in here, mix it in really well and help that moisture get into these very fine fibers, once it's moistened, it will have excellent retention of mm -hmm. water. So you can moisten it easily and then it will hold that water and make it available to the plants. Okay. And an, another attribute that it has, which seems a bit counterintuitive, is that it has pretty good drainage because of the very <laughs> fine particles. Okay. Another thing that we'll find oftentimes in some of our soil mixes is this product called perlite and you can tell here it's it's very very fine yeah. it's almost yeah. like a ground up styrofoam I guess if you will is what it, it looks like in texture and so perlite's added to mixes what they provide to that mix is improved drainage yeah. and then a third product here is the vermiculite and uh, again, it, it has a, a bit of a different texture. It's almost corky feeling. <laughs> it has the ability to absorb moisture and it could also be used in a mix to help improve drainage just by creating some space inside that media and allowing channels for water to go down through there. Okay. Um, I didn't bring any today, but other things that you might commonly see in your mixes would be um, shredded barks, uh -huh. sand, mm -hmm even, and in some cases, some more unique type products like uh, coconut fibers um, and things of that nature. So a, a lot of different base products that go into making some of these specialty mixes. And so before we get into talking about the mixes, I'd like for us to just talk a little bit about what are the basic jobs that a potting media okay. needs to provide to a house plant, right? Mm -hmm. So we've kind of mentioned it already. Of course, it needs to be able to accept and hold water. <laughs> yes, if the, if the media can't hold water, then it's not available to the, the root zone of those plants, right? right? Uh, another thing that's tied very closely with that same concept is nutrient uptake. That nutrients is dissolved mm -hmm. in what we call a, a soil solution, and then that uh, that solution is taken up through the roots. Good, that's good. So those are the two basic jobs oh, that good. we're really looking for these things to do. Um, other kind of supporting aspects would be stabilization. Okay. So when we have larger foliage plants, um, some of those actually could benefit from a heavier um, soil media to help anchor their mm -hmm. roots and hold them upright. Um, and then the final thing I'd like to mention there as far as their basic jobs is aeration. Yeah. Some, so important. Yeah, some plants mm -hmm. actually, believe it or not, don't need soil at all. So lots of different options and, and we want to make sure that 
our plants are being delivered the things that they need to thrive. Okay. And so that's before you get into that, so soilless. Oh media. yes, good point. Okay, yeah. so you, I hope you've noticed that we've been referring to our medias as media okay. and not soil. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we when you hear someone say a soilless media, that means that there is no native soil in these products. Okay. okay? So peat moss is not soil. It's peat moss. <laughs> um, uh, if it had soil in it, I'm, I'm, well, I'll say some advantages of a soilless media or is that we have better control over the density of okay. that product, better control over um, water retention and um, aeration. And then also we know that soilless medias are disease and weed free. Uh, and really that's, that's the key. number one, yeah, okay. super, super important. Right. So if you just went out in your yard and you know dug up a couple buckets of soil and tried to plant your house plants in them, uh, you probably would not have the success that right. you have in mind Good point, that you'd be okay. looking for. Okay. Okay. So okay. that's what we're referying to when we're saying soilless medias. Because yeah, we hear it a lot these days. Yes, soilless media. Okay. yes, Good. so much. Good. So thanks for asking that. Um, Okay, great. So we'll just jump okay. in to a few of the different mixes. Now, there's lots of brands out there on the market, <laughs> right? I mean, all, right. all different kinds of brands, all different types of mixes. But I've picked four to share with everybody today that I feel like are, are pretty common. So lots of folks grow African violets. Mm -hmm. All right, if you're not familiar with African violets, know that um, they really prefer to be watered from underneath. Mm -hmm. They don't like to have a lot of moisture <laughs> on their leaves. And so this is the product that we're looking at for African violet. Looks good and rich. It does look rich. And let me kind of do this so you can see the texture of it. So if you can look in here, you can actually see that we have quite, the base of course is a peat moss, but we have quite a bit of bark in here as well like shredded pieces of bark, mm. finely shredded, you know, not big pieces, but finely shredded bark. You can see these white um, dots here, that's perlite. perlite. Okay. Having that component of the peat moss allows this mix to be able to wick moisture up from the base of that African violet container. Um, the next one on our list here is a succulent mix. <laughs> and it has a much different, even color, not only texture, but color. You can see this one's a, a lot lighter, a lot drier. And I'm going to say that the, uh, probably, you know, 98% of that, the base is peat moss. Mm. And, you know, depending on what you're doing, you could um, use a succulent mix for your cactus, but um, if you've out, been out there shopping, you will notice <laughs> that they even have a specialty mix for cactus. Um, and you can see this one is much darker right. in color. And it actually has a heavier feel to it than the other one did. And so I know that you can't tell it, um, but this one actually has quite a bit of sand oh. in the mix. Okay. So what is sand doing? Sand is a, a cor very coarse particle, and so it's providing, again, drainage. So Good. even more drainage in this mix than what we were finding in the succulent mix. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to share with y'all today, this is really unique. So this is a mix <laughs> that you might use um, for orchids. If you're repotting orchids up, it's very, very coarse. It has no peat moss in it. This is all bark, shredded bark, largely shredded bark. And then let me pick up one of these pieces so you can see here. This is charcoal. Yeah, that's something, yeah, charcoal. Yeah, yeah. and so that also do, does a lot for um, uh, preventing fungus development. So like we talked about before, orchids really need excellent aeration. They do not want their roots to be in a heavy type media that's going to retain moisture for any amount of time. Um, you could act, some orchids actually could survive just on misting. Mm. Um, so just misting those roots periodically. But if you, again, you know, it's a, a big orchid, you need something that, um, uh, needs an anchor, you know, to hold it up and you're doing those in pots, that would be an excellent option. And so with that, mm -hmm. I'd like to point out that uh, there's lots of university resources for mix your own recipes yes. for specialty soil mixes. How about that? Yes. And of course, we have those links on our website. 
Excellent. Sure. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that as well. That's good, good stuff, Celeste. Good. good stuff. All right. Thank you much. Yes, sir. You're, you're welcome. welcome. Anytime. Okay, so this is a sumac, and I wanted to show y'all something very unique. Leaf galls on the undersides of these leaves. Leaf galls are unique, all, all galls are unique in that they can be caused from a number of different things. Usually vectored by insects, sucking insects like parasitic wasps, aphids, um, mites, things of that nature. And um, they create these abnormal growths on leaves. And I'm gonna break one open. And on the insides of these galls, usually you will see uh, the developing insects. Um, if you get there later on in the life cycle, sometimes they have already um, busted outside of those galls, you know, had exit holes. So these leaf galls are purely cosmetic. They are not affecting the health of this plant and we wouldn't recommend any type of treatment. Let's talk about vegetable pests. All right, specifically, let's talk about squash pests. Sure, I brought a squash plant here today okay. just to show you. We often use transplants, put them into the garden, and guess what? The insects are just waiting uh -huh. for these plants, uh -huh. okay? And one thing we often see attacking the leaves are these little cucumber beetles. Yes. So they can smell a squash plant pretty far away, right. and they <laughs> zoom in on it. So many times you'll see the leaves just tattered so one thing I might suggest, there's a thing called a uh, floating row cover mm -hmm. or cheesecloth, something like that. You right. can actually cover tender plants, but still let the light in, but kind of exclude these pests. Okay. And then that way you don't have to use so much insecticide because okay. otherwise they, they could eat the plants almost to the ground. Wow, because they pretty much what, skeletonize the leaves for yeah, the most part? Yeah, they look all skeletonized. You can right. see feeding wow. between the vein or even you know more feeding than that. Okay, all right. Uh, another thing, once a, you might want to keep the row cover on for a while because we have other pests that will get on squash. Uh, squash bugs overwinter mm -hmm. around your garden. Uh, a good thing to do is lay down flat boards around the edge of your okay. garden. Lift those boards up in the spring, you'll see the overwintering squash bugs will be there. You can just tap those boards into a bucket of soapy water uh. and get rid of them because they're going to move into the into the garden and start laying their bronze color eggs. Yes. So if you those. see those yeah. eggs, Chris, what do you do with them? Get them off. Yeah, you squish yeah. them with your yeah. uh, forefinger and your thumb and just crush them. <laughs> squash or, them. Or right. tear off the part of the leaf that they're on. Right. Because those are gonna uh, give rise to the little nymphs and they're gonna be little gray bugs. Okay. And before you know it, you can be covered up with squash bugs. Ow. Another pest we have uh, is called the squash vine borer. It's a clear wing moth borer. It's related to dogwood borers and peach tree borers. Okay. It's a red moth. And most moths fly at night. This one flies during the day. Mm -hmm. It likes the bright sunshine. And it's, once that squash starts you know, trailing out, growing a little bit, it's gonna lay its eggs on the vine. Okay. So until the plant maybe it is just starting to, it's gonna take a while for the squash plant to start blooming. Up till then, keep that floating row cover on it so it doesn't lay an egg because the caterpillar that arises from that egg will tunnel into the vine, mm -hmm. devour it from the inside, and about the time you have squash producing, the vine might just die. Wow, just collapses. Uh, right. Now when you have yeah. this, uh, try not to put the, the, the row cover over the flowers. Okay. If it starts blooming, you gotta have an entryway for the bees to pollinate it. Okay. Squash bees and other native bees. And guys too, for the squash bug, going back to that, practice good sanitation would be something else you would recommend as well? Yeah, cleaning up uh, debris and stuff yeah. around the garden. But uh, putting those boards down, they're gonna want, need a place to overwinter. Fence okay. rows and yeah. play, overgrown places like that. Same for, you know, Colorado potato beetles would do the same thing on potatoes. They move out from the weedy areas back into the garden. Wow. Yeah, so. And these are considered to be the major pests of the squash. Yeah, right? that's, squash that's the, the main thing. Yeah. I think the worst thing, truthfully, has to be that squash vine borer because yes. it can kill yes. the whole vine. Yes. So uh, we can use insecticide sprays for that, but it's difficult because you have a plant that's blooming at the same time, and you really don't want to spray the flowers when, when a plant's blooming because sure. that could hurt good the point. bees. Good point. So you have to be very careful and maybe spray the base and up till where, stop where the blooms are. You okay. know, you don't want to spray. Blooms. Good stuff. Now let's talk about tomato pests. 
Oh, tomato. everybody likes to grow tomatoes. Yeah, everybody right? has at least yes. one or two tomatoes, yes. maybe a pepper thrown in there. I brought a tomato plant today. Okay. It's it's going good. When they put those in the ground, sometimes you find them the next day and they've been clipped off. Uh -huh. Now, what could do that? It's the cutworm. Cutworm, uh -huh. exactly. Right. Most a lot of these cutworms don't even overwinter here, but they fly up on these spring storm fronts that we have. So the moth is. Down, lives down south, like the black cutworm. Okay. They lay their eggs on weeds and things, and then as soon as you start tilling your garden and planting your vegetables, guess what? They're looking for something to eat. <laughs> right. They're nocturnal feeders. Okay. So they're under clumps of dirt in the soil uh, during the uh, daytime. They come out at night, okay. and then they clip a plant and pull it back into their underground den to feed on. Wow, that's interesting. So some people will get uh, around the plant, put a, li a little circle with aluminum foil mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that will kind of deter the cutworms a little bit okay. some people organic they might put within that circle they might put diatomaceous earth ah. or something irritating the insect okay. um, so those are some things and then of course we have insecticides sure. that you could spray the so you want to spray the soil around the plant and the base of the plant okay. so that when they walk across the soil at night they pick them. up the insecticide Okay, how about that? Yeah. Now what about aphids? Yeah, yeah aphids, uh, they, they can fly. Some aphids <laughs> fly and they'll move in from wild host plants, weeds and such. Mm -hmm. They'll land on usually the terminal of the plant, these new tender leaves. And aphids can give rise to other aphids very quickly. Mm -hmm. The female can either lay eggs or she can give rise to uh, a live young, wow. so live birth. So you have lots of aphids very quick. Their life cycle is very fast. Okay. And, and so you can start out with just a few wing forms that come in, they start laying eggs or giving birth, and then you have lots of aphids. So I like to, if I see aphids on a plant and I haven't put it in the ground, I take it, lay it on its side, and wash it down with soapy water. Okay. With a hose, a really right. strong jet of ho uh, water. Okay. So you just blast the aphids off. And you could really do that still when they're in the garden. If you see a tomato plant in the morning, just blast the top of it. You see some aphids and just physically remove them. Okay. And then let the lady beetles and uh -huh. other predators. So a lot of people, they want to do the first thing is use an insecticide. Yes. But I say caution with aphids because if you just wait a couple weeks, lady beetles will lay their eggs there. They're lemon yellow eggs. Mm -hmm. They lay them on the leaves amongst the aphids. There's also a type fly called surfid flies yeah. or hover flies. They'll lay a single white egg right there where the aphids are and the larva is predaceous. It'll just wow. tear them apart. There's a lot of good beneficial insects. If we don't use a lot of insecticide in the garden, we can really build up good numbers of these insects. Good, so, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Good, good. Okay, the, so, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say the next thing is protecting the fruit. Okay. So we're, we have a plant, we've got good size on it, it's flowering. There's lots of different caterpillars that okay. will lay eggs on, on the fruit or on the leaves nearby. The, probably the big one you see is the, is the uh, tomato or tobacco hornworm. Uh -huh. And they have the little tail looking thing yeah. at the tail end. <laughs> and these caterpillars will get several inches long when full size. And often you don't see them when they're small, they, they kind of camouflage. Yeah. One time, uh, not too long ago, I, I had tomatoes on my deck and guess what? We had corn earworms, we had hornworms, we had yellow striped army worms, we had southern army worms. There's a whole bunch of caterpillars. And all of this you said was in the city. Yeah, right? this was this right in, in suburbia right. Right. And, and they they find your plants. Mm -hmm. So the, the moths are out at night, they lay their eggs on the leaves of the plant or on the fruit and then they hatch out in a, in a couple days and those caterpillars might feed for a couple weeks. Wow. So when they're tiny, they don't do that much damage, but maybe by the time they get an inch long, when they're about a fourth or fifth instar or, or stage, yeah. they can do a lot of feeding da damage. For sure. Yeah. So uh, usually you can pick off, if you just have a few plants, you mm -hmm. can pick them off every day, but you have to be out there almost every day because they can <laughs> do a lot of damage uh -huh. and they're hard to see. Uh, insecticides can be used. One of the safer products for caterpillars is BT. Yes. It stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterial toxin. It's very safe for humans to be around and pets, but it's very toxic to caterpillars. It paralyzes their midgut. Uh. 
and then they stop feeding yeah. almost immediately and then they soon die. But it won't hurt your beneficial insects, Good. your lady Airport. beetles, surface flies, and other things. Okay. Green lacewings, for instance. So BT is one of the safer things for gardeners to use. We have a publication, uh, uh, UT Extension Publications, it's called You Can Control Garden Insects. You might want to check that out online. It is a good online. publication. Yeah, it has, it has some pictures of what the insects look for and also control recommendations. Okay. And also some on the beneficial insects. Doc, we're glad you're here. That's good stuff. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. We can tell you love this stuff. Oh, it's great. <laughs> What's better? <laughs> Thank you. All of the flowers that we planted seem to be doing very well, all three kinds. But we noticed that there are some that have got long shoots on them or are kind of leggy, and we would like for them to bush out. So now's the time. To, I know you might, a lot of people will have a hard time doing this because you end up cutting up some flowers. But it's best to cut them back, head them back at this time, and then they will, will branch out and be prettier. And you want to cut them back to a Another joint where a leaf comes out so you don't leave any empty stubs. The key to good pruning is to know that you were never there, so you prune so it doesn't look like you ever pruned it. Now all the uh, long branches have been headed back and the plants will each try to bush out and become more beautiful. All right, Celeste, uh, Q&A segment, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. These Let's are good questions. Throw them, throw them at me. All right, we're gonna throw them <laughs> at you, all right? Here's our first viewer email. For years, I've had an issue with small black gnats infesting both my indoor and outdoor potted plants. I've tried fungicidal soap, dishwashing liquid, white vinegar, etc., to no avail. How do I get rid of and prevent these infestations in the future? This is Ed Winter from Memphis, Tennessee. So Celeste, mm -hmm. she's tried the fungicidal soap, dishwashing liquid, vinegar. Okay. To no avail. No avail. So what is this that we're talking about, you think? Okay, sounds like fungus gnats I to me. I would agree with that. Okay. I would agree. Um, so there are a few things, even before I would, you know, reach out to any type of uh, fungicide or, or insecticides or chemicals or right. anything okay. like that. Okay. Let's really focus on um, the conditions because that is what is conducive mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the replication of these fungus gnats, mm -hmm. okay? So more moist soil. Is, would be something that I would want to try to get away from. Uh, that they lay nice. their, you know, larva right at the surface mm -hmm. of that moist soil, and if the soil uh, is allowed to dry out periodically, those larvae might have been laid. But if the soil surface dries, they can't develop. Right. So <clears throat> making sure that we're not overwatering. That's the key. Yes, yeah. and just allowing time for that moisture level, you know, to fluctuate, drop, and we don't want to keep them constantly moist all the time. So that would be my number one. Number two would be uh, making sure that we're, you know, starting with clean soil. Mm -hmm. So um, try not to reuse soil that you know has been infested, right. you know, with fungus gnat larvae in the past. Those would be my two suggestions. Those are my two as well. Yeah. Oh, good. But yeah, if you keep that so moist, uh, yeah, you're going to have problems with that. I and mean, we usually get questions about this all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, let that soil dry out. Uh, Early in spring, when folks are trying to get their seeds started mm -hmm. indoors, indoors, and they yes. don't want to let those seedlings dry out, which, you know, it's important. But um, at the same time, if we, if we keep them too wet, that's when you start to see the development of Because they're going to breed and there. develop in moist soils, mm -hmm. right? So let that soil dry out. Now, would you use anything like insecticidal soap or anything like that? Um, I never have. Okay. But, I haven't either. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I haven't. I don't see why an insecticidal soap wouldn't, you know, provide some benefit in that type sure. of situation. Um, but really, just cultural Right. Practices. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Cultural practices, Ms. Edwina. Hope that helps you out. Thank you for that question. Here's our next viewer email. My endless summer bloom struck hydrangea is drooping. I think it is because the blooms are heavy. Should I attempt to prop it up or should I cut back some of the drooping branches? Thanks, Marjorie in Millington, Tennessee. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Should she prop it up 
or if it if it were me i would probably okay. just cut those that are too heavy and bring them inside and enjoy them for a cup flower ah, arrangement there you go. right while there you while go, it's Margaret. nice uh, while they're in full bloom go ahead and make that cut make the cut down um, pretty low and that's okay. going to encourage some branching okay. from that particular cane so next year um keeping in mind, you know, that you don't do any more pruning for sure. this season. That cane that was too heavy this year is now shorter and has put out uh, uh -huh. two lateral shoots. Okay. So, you know, we're trying to build the sturdiness of this plant instead of having four or five shoots that are five feet tall. Now we're going to mm -hmm. have 10 that are, you know, four feet tall. Does that make sense? Oh, I like that. Okay. So I like that. That's I actually I have an endless summer. Uh, Bloom second home, so I'm gonna yeah. I wrote my notes down on that one. Um, yeah, so you just come about. And the thing about the endless summer is this: old wood, new wood. Does it depend? Well, they huh? they do have some remontant uh -huh. qualities. Okay. So they can bloom on new wood, okay. but that won't be until later into in the, into the growing season. Okay. We're talking like, yeah. you know, in some cases like into. July and August. So it okay. depends on when your you know your first frost sure. start um, where you're at in the country. But in my zone in seven, um, we had some at a, a county office that accidentally got sheared all the way to the ground oh, wow. okay. in uh, the early spring, which is not the appropriate time to prune those macrophyllas. And uh, I was so sad, and they did not have a bloom display that mm. spring, but the plants grew beautifully. And I had a beautiful Good. macrophylla display in uh, late August. How about that? So, yeah. So, they so they, okay. it has the capabilities of having some bloom on new and old wood. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. All right, Marjorie. There you, there you have it. Yeah, just prune some of that off and bring it in the house. I yeah. like that. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Celeste, fun as always. Oh, fun as always. Thanks. Yeah, you did good. It's been, it's been fun. It's, it's been always fun. a challenge. I'm always <laughs> nervous for question and answer. Ah, it's been Woo. good. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to learn more about houseplants or bugs that are eating your vegetables, go to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.